John, in this movie, as well as Three's Company and everything almost that we see you do, you project such an up and positive attitude about everything. Now, is that your real image? I know it's your image, but is that really you, or are you faking us out it's a little bit? It's all the orange juice I drink. It's so good for you. Blood sugar just hits. Um, I don't know about up, because there's a lot of times where I'm down, but positive... I think I, I really am positive. I think I got that from my mom and dad. And um, my mom, for example, uh, she wakes up like this, hi, and she goes to sleep, good night, you know. And from that, from the hi to the good night, is just uh, she's a, she's a like a sparkler. And me compared to her, I would be like. Uh, a punk rock guy from the Dead Boys or, or something like that compared to my mother who's just, she's a skyrocket. And, and I guess I reflect some of her, you know, sort of positive energy. And I think I reflect some of my dad's, uh, you know, um, outlook on life too. But I do have my moments where I'm a bit of a drag, I must say. <laughs> I wonder also, in TV Guide one time, you gave a quote, and you said, I'm terrified of everybody all the time. Oh, yeah. Are you really? Oh, yeah. See, I, I really have experienced that I am absolutely terrified of everything and everyone at all times. That, that you, for example, will hurt me, hurt my feelings, attack me. Uh, so for that fact i learned karate you know uh in the early 70s to to ward off you if you start to scratch me or something i know how to do that i learned that out of fear uh i learned how to be funny out of fear uh, i learned how to be funny out of fear <laughs> i was watching this guy over here <laughs> John Ritter and Joyce DeWick, good morning. Good morning, Jane. 24 years ago. Today. Today. Yeah. Tonight, Today. actually. Tonight. Yeah. You started Freeze Company. Yeah, yeah we aired the yeah. first time. Feels like yesterday? And, the, you know, kind we started. Kind of, sort of, but not really. <laughs> well, it feels like the day way before yesterday. <laughs> What's it like all these years later? You are still a hit on Nick at Night with Freeze Company. It's still, I, I even remember that episode. I mean, you remember really? so many of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I loved Free's Company. You it's, were just uh, I was going just, to sixth grade. Yeah, baby okay. yeah. <laughs> It's amazing how people remember it so clearly. I mean, people will stop us on the street and will practically quote half of an episode. They, everybody sort of has their favorites. And it's amazing what they can remember, way more than I can remember. This is a show that really dealt with, with sex and, and sexual situations in a very groundbreaking way. I mean, do you think the show would work today in the Sex and the City environment that we live in on, t on television? Well, cable? Uh, yeah, but the, the roommates would always have to be naked. Uh, <laughs> there, there was a, uh, we had our, our, our wonderful costume guy named Len Marcus, uh -huh. who went to do in, in uh, the summer a movie with Dean Jones at Disney, and Dean Jones loved him and said, why don't you leave that godless devil show and come to work <laughs> well, and, you know i said there's there's something to be said for a godless devil show you know i'm always for a little mindless dribble among our culture uh, you know i said there's there's something to be said for a godless devil show you know i'm always for a little mindless dribble <laughs> among our culture are you back so soon you were listening no i was not listening and I am so proud of you. That was a tremendous sacrifice you made, Bridget. Well, you know, it was the right thing to do. It was actually you, Dad. I mean, you told me not to be selfish because I could be ruining his future. Wow, you listened. I, I, I can't tell you how much this means to me. Besides, when he got all cleaned up and the bristle marks faded, he lost, like, half his hotness. No, stop right there. You listen. You, you listen to your dad. That was not even nearly as hot as Damien. No, 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 no. You listen. I'm going to call Damien. Lala, lala, lala. I'm taking it back. You listened. 
let's all admit it. We're all scared. Yeah, they all admit it. We're all a little scared. You know, we're all going through life uh, over over our left shoulder, as Carlos Castaneda says. You know, the 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 specter of death is always ready to go like this. So we're all afraid to die and i mean in 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 the bigger sense we're we're all a little a little afraid when we get up in the morning if we're going to make it but we mask that with our armor and and our stuff like that well i just come right out and say hey i got nothing to hide man i'm scared to die i'm scared to live you know and but all of that aside it's it can be a ball and you can have love and have friends and have you know have meaning to your life but underneath it there's a little guy going i don't think i can make it <laughs> <laughs> You and your wife are expecting a baby any time now, right? Yeah, yeah. Are I don't think I'll tell the kid I'm terrified until he's old enough to uh, to understand that. Hi, son. Welcome to the world. I'm as scared as you are. <laughs> no, I'm I'm really thrilled um, about. Nancy should have the baby around February 10th, um, so... Just about the time the film opens. Yeah, yeah, two little babies out there. Um, the, uh, the idea of, of my wife having a little life inside really puts a perspective on, on, on film and television and all of that as something that's fun to do, but this is where, this is where the, the, the attention should go. Mr. Ritter, when, when Three's Company uh, ended, or was getting to the end, uh, were you ever worried that maybe you might sink into, like, sitcom obscurity, that one of the people you'd be a trivia answer one day? Or did you ever take, did you ever think about that? When, when I got Three's Company, I knew when I did the pilot that if it sold and was successful, I would have to run like hell away from that stereotype of the four camera sex com farce mindless drivel um you know joke 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 screaming you know adolescent like arch a video archie betty and veronica i would have to so what i did i did a movie of the week where i played a, uh, a paraplegic then one where i played a drunk out of work minor league baseball player and then a minister uh, so I could collect a body of work that I could maybe, if not the public would be that familiar with, at least the people who hire and fire would know that I was more serious than just, oh, Chrissy K. Last of all, where's the rent money, you know? Well, for the longest time, Three's Company seemed to get a lot of flack from people, and a lot of very vicious. Who uh, help me. And in fact, I think you were saying earlier there was a book that was particularly vicious. There was a, this is fun, but there was a coffee table book that either Richard Klein uh, from Three's Company or Carol Summers gave to me, who is our script girl. <laughs> they gave it to me like this, mm, my children of the dam. Mm. And I opened it up and said, a big chapter, Three's Company, page after page after page of us and dialogue from the show and pictures I'd never seen. It said there are three schools of thought on Three's Company. Number one, that is absolutely the worst TV sitcom in America today. Two, that it is absolutely the worst TV show in the history of American television. Or three, that it is absolutely the worst thing in America today. Oh, I was, I was, I experienced grief as though there had been a death in the family. And um, in a way there was. I, that character, that delicious character that I was doing was killed off before she was finished. I never felt that I finished that character and I had, I really, I loved what I had created with her. So it, it was devastating. I was, I was in a, um, a deep depression for almost a year. And then one day I woke up and I thought, rather than looking at what I don't have, Suzanne, why don't you look at what you do have? What I did have was enormous fame that had come from being on the number one show in the country for six years straight. And I decided to use my fame to uh, start a nightclub act. I had enough fame to be able to open my first night at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, not in some dump somewhere. And, and then I wrote my, my second book, and then I went into the fitness business, and then um, that led to, uh, everything led to everything. And soon I had my own series again, She's the Sheriff, and then I had my own talk show, and then Step by Step, and, and then the jewelry business grew, and the fitness business grew, and 
I, I look back on it now, um, painful as it was, it was an opportunity. I, you know, I either could have folded and disappeared or and been a victim or do what I did, which is decide to see where the opportunity was. And um, I, I have had a second turn. Rarely do people in my business get a second turn. And I decided that if I got a second turn, I was going to make the most of it and that never again would I only do one thing. Because that was really the death of me, was that I only was an actress. And when I couldn't work on their show, and on contractually couldn't work on any other show for a better part of a decade, um, that was when I realized, don't have all your eggs in one basket in this business. So that's when I diversified and became a multi-dimensional uh, person. And uh, I, my only complaint that I have today uh, that I gripe about all the time is that I work too much, you know. So don't feel sorry for me. Most people who have been around as long as I've been, you know, are waiting for the phone to ring. I'm, I sit there and hope the phone won't for a day. <laughs> that it is absolutely the worst TV show in the history of American television, or three, that it is absolutely the worst thing in America today. And I'm going, what an opener. I mean, whoa, not even Morton Downey Jr. gets that kind of flack. Well, no, but anyway, uh, I'm going, but it seems to me, except for uh, some cases, the critics were okay, if not nice to me. And, and to some of the actors, but they were really down on where the show was going. But the show was a kind of formula show. It wasn't like really anything that new. Well, didn't Lucille Ball intercede on the show's behalf? And then after the sixth year, Lucille Ball, right, she, uh, she sort of endorsed the show and did a, she hosted a retrospective and gave the show its first little air of respectability. Well, working with Blake Edwards must have been a real thrill. Uh, I understand you almost worked on another project with him earlier. I uh, was asked, I met with Blake and Tony Adams uh, about 10 years ago to do a, um, a movie that would have been a sort of a spy comedy called The Ferret that I, I'd still love to do with him. It's such a great idea. But uh, uh, he and I really liked each other way back then, and we always wanted to, we could never get the schedules right, though, but now was the right time, it seemed. Well, how was the first day of shooting? Uh, your first scene, and you you probably went home and told your wife about it. How do you describe that first day of shooting? I came home. I, I, I came home from my first day of shooting, and Nancy says, how, how was it with Blake? And I said, it's fascinating. I was totally nude. She goes, right, yeah. No, seriously. I said, I was naked. She goes, as the character, right? You know, I said, no. Well, who saw you? I said, um, Allison, Heidi, Denise, Danny, the girl, the hair, makeup, the Wranglers, and, and a few people who we don't know. And I went. But it was integral to the plot. Well, I hate to bring up the beard, but uh, and the promo was running for the movie, and all the girls were commenting on the beard, whether they liked it or didn't like it. Uh, was that a conscious decision on your part to kind of change your image for this movie? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I got the People's Choice Award for Hooperman, and Tony Adams saw that and called up Blake and said, Blake, I just saw John on TV. He has a beard now, He because they had considered me, but discarded my name from the list because I looked too young. They said he looks old enough to play the character of Zach now with the beard. So Blake said, I'd like to see you. And he said, How, what do you have the beard for? I said, that's just my natural state when I don't have to pretend to be Hooperman. So he said, keep the beard and do the movie. Well, someone was comparing you to, a lot to uh, uh, Chevy Chase and uh, Steve Martin doing the physical type of comedy. Now, the Zach character, there's a lot more dimension to him than just, you know, falling around pranning. But in the ads for the movie, basically they focus on that, you know, the physical comedy coming down the steps. Uh, does that bother you, you at all? I'll tell you, I never, I'm always fascinated to, to, to see what they promote in a film. I never know. And uh, I think they said if you, if you get him into the, if you get him into the, however you get him in is fine.
report to you on the sudden and unexpected death last night of television actor John Ritter at the age of 54. Ritter first hit it big in 1970s television sitcom Three's Company, playing a lecherous bachelor living with two female roommates. In his current show, Ritter played a doting father who set rules for boys dating his daughter. And that's fine with me. Sweet. As long as it's okay with my daughter. Otherwise, you will continue to date her and no one but her until she is finished with you because if you make her cry i will make you cry ritter's sudden death was blamed on a heart condition that is hard to detect but not as rare as you might think cbs news medical correspondent elizabeth Caledon is here with more about it elizabeth well, Dan, John Ritter died of something known as aortic dissection, in which the aorta suddenly tears or breaks, causing massive internal bleeding, which can lead to heart attack or stroke. The aorta is the main artery of the human body that basically looks like a candy cane, running from the heart all the way down to the abdomen. It can tear anywhere if weakened. It's not yet known what led to Ritter's condition, but common causes are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and blunt trauma, like a car accident. Genetic defects can also play a role. What makes this condition so deadly is it's tough to diagnose and there's very little time to react. The symptoms are chest pain and sometimes back pain, so it's often mistaken for heart attack, even food poisoning. Even food poisoning. Food poisoning. Shocking was the sudden death of a much younger man. John Ritter was only 54. A member of our ABC family, he was at work on the set of his TV show, Eight Simple Rules for Dating My Teenage Daughter, when he suddenly fell sick. He died soon afterwards. aloof about John Ritter. This was John just last Sunday. He was doing an ABC promotion at Disney's California Adventure. Here we go. One, two, and three. Perfect. He mangles and jokes. Does shtick. But I would never, ever, ever leave this show. Uh, ever. That's what Suzanne said. <laughs> I promise I wouldn't do this. He enjoyed people was wary of celebrity. Thank Thanks, sweetie. Where's this? Celebrity stuff is completely empty. Now, it's nice, the, some of the perks of being a celebrity and all of that, but it's, I equate it for being out in the sun. It's very, very warming and nice, and sometimes you get a nice glow, but if you're in the sun for too long, we know it can kill you. The, some of the perks of being a celebrity and all of that, but it's, I equate it for being out in the sun. It's very, very warming and nice, and sometimes you get a nice glow, but if you're in the sun for too long, we know it can kill you. Experience with celebrity. His father, Tex Ritter, was the singing cowboy of movie westerns in the 30s and 40s. Well, I'm Tex Reed from the state marshal's office. My brother would say, come on, Dad's on TV, and we'd go down Saturday morning and watch Dad, you know. It, he basically was himself. His name wasn't Tex Ritter. He always had Tex something. Tex Ritter tried to discourage his son from show business, but John's younger brother says John was a born performer, a natural comic. John was a goofball. That's what somebody said. You know, John was a clown. Perhaps sometimes he felt as though... That was his role, and he probably would have liked to not have taken it, but he was. He was very good at it. The greatness of John was that he was able to continually draw audiences to him no matter what he did. Henry Winkler, the Fonz, was John Ritter's close friend for 25 years. Today, he looked back. I, I directed him. I, I, I produced shows that he starred in no matter what he did. He brought to it an energy and a, 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 a spirit that was just, aren't we lucky that we're here and isn't this terrific? Ritter's talent was obvious early. Nina Foch was his drama teacher in college. He's one of my most memorable students, one of my most satisfying students, because anything you gave him to do, he could do it. Well, After school, he landed small parts in several TV series. Whatever songs you think best. Then got his real break when he won the role of a preacher on the wall. Uh, that's quite all right. Then, in 1975, Ritter got the part he's best known for. He beat out 50 other actors, including Billy Crystal, to land the lead of a new series called Three's Company. He, Suzanne Summers, and Joyce DeWitt shared an apartment. 
to avoid raised eyebrows about co-ed living, Ritter's character let the landlord think he was gay. Oh, yes. Are you crazy moving in with two girls? Not my girl. Wait a minute, it'll be strictly platonic. Well, I don't care what it is. What does that mean? Like you and me, Stanley. John Ritter proved his talents went beyond comedy. He played a variety of roles on TV, in movies, and on Broadway. He was a detective, a gay store manager, a womanizing alcoholic. John Ritter should be on television. John Ritter should be in movies. John Ritter should always be performing. He's just good. I think he's better than just about everybody out there. If you talk to John, just have a serious conversation with him, he can do drama as well as anybody. Maybe I shouldn't stay over here. Actor and writer Billy Bob Thornton worked with Ritter in both TV and oh, film. He's one of the good guys. He's one of, one of the people that you root for. He deserves so much. He's a kind-hearted person, a great soul, a great talent, and uh, my friend. A year ago, John Ritter embarked on the last chapter of his professional life, a series called Eight Simple Rules for Dating My Teenage Daughter. It's become one of the most successful series on ABC's schedule. I can't wait anything else. Panty lines, hello. Panty lines, hello, are fine. Actually, they were a pretty big deal in my day. Well, we're the phone generation. Well, maybe that's why your generation is so angry. You're always walking around with a wedge. In real life, John Ritter had four children. A daughter with his current wife, Amy Yasbeck, and two boys and a girl with his former wife, Nancy Morgan. He was still married to Morgan when, in 1980, Barbara Walters interviewed him and asked him this question. We look into the, into the future, talking about the future and the past. How would you want to be remembered? Mm, gee. I keep hearing my dad's voice going, now be humble, son. Just as a guy who, who, who was interested in in the golden thread that, that intertwines all of us together. You know, that golden thread that goes through me and you and the cameraman and all the people out there and back through Nancy, that what an artist can do or some, anyone can do if, if, if their willingness to pluck that and either it makes you laugh or it makes you cry. It's that golden thread of humanity and I'd like to be remembered as maybe a guy who, who plucked a few of those. Andrew, we just talked about it. These previous settlements, they've already gotten $14 million. What is different about what they're going after now? Well, $14 million is only part of what they're seeking in compensation here. They're seeking $67 million, which while that may seem to be a high number to some people, you have to realize that the family of John Ritter is entitled to be compensated uh, for what he would have earned had he not died as a result of malpractice. This is a beloved TV icon who is earning several million dollars a year. Uh, he was uh, starring in a network series uh, show at the time of his death, and he had a life expectancy where he could work for another 20 years in the business. And when you start multiplying those millions of dollars times 20 plus years, that's how you get up in that range. So even though he settled with some of the hospitals and medical providers uh, for 14 million, there still is a lot more that the family is entitled to, and they're going to court against the doctors that did not settle with them already. Okay, and what will they have to prove to win this money? Well, they have to prove that the doctors that they're suing committed medical malpractice. What that means is medical negligence or a departure from the accepted standard of medical care. So what will happen at this trial is the plaintiff's attorneys, uh, the family's attorneys, will bring in experts, physicians that specialize in the areas of cardiology, radiology, with good credentials. They'll get on the stand and they'll tell the jury how the doctors who are being sued departed from the standard of care, how they committed malpractice. In response, the defendant's lawyers, the doctor's lawyers, will put on their experts, more doctors, to say they did everything appropriately. It will be up to the jury to decide uh, which experts experts to believe in, in, in rendering a decision, uh, that's what they're going to base it on. And the defendants in this case are claiming that Ritter actually turned down, was rather was turned down for life insurance because of a heart condition. Tell us right. why this is going to matter so much in this case. Uh, if anything, I think that will help the family in their case. It was documented that he had a
had a heart condition. Uh, this wasn't something that just came up out of nowhere. So somewhere in his medical records, it was documented that he had a medical condition. And when someone has a medical condition uh, dealing with their heart, uh, it's supposed to be followed and treated and managed by their doctor so that they don't all of a sudden have an aneurysm uh, where the aorta can burst and they can die from it. So if anything, I think that will be helpful to the family. Yeah. You talked about that $67 million that he potentially could have earned because he's a TV star. But the flip side of that is also that the TV business is so fickle. The show could have been canceled, so that number really may not be a guarantee, wouldn't you say? Well, it may or may not, but, you know, that's going to be the burden of proof. What the plaintiff, the family's lawyers will do is they'll explain to the jury, I'm sure through expert testimony, that John Ritter, this is a man that survived in the TV business for decades. Everyone grew up with him in Three's Company, uh, and he has staying power, and he's well-loved by the networks. So even if this show failed, uh, the argument, I'm sure, would be that he'd likely get picked up for another TV show or possibly a movie, that by being John Ritter, he has significant earning potential to make millions of dollars a year. It's really a, a tough case. It's tough on a family, and it was so jarring when this happened. It's, it was yeah. so sudden. All right, uh, attorney Andrew Smiley. Andrew, thank you. Thank well, last month, I sat down for an emotional conversation with Amy Asbeck, the widow of actor John Ritter. We talked just as her $67 million wrongful death lawsuit was set to get underway against two doctors who treated the popular actor the day that he died. Last Friday, the jury had disapp disappointing news for the Ritter family. In a sometimes emotional five-week trial, Amy Yazbeck, Ritter's widow, recounted to the jury as she had to me the final moments with her husband in the hospital on their daughter's fifth birthday. And he was smiling at me. You know, people say, did you get to say I love you? I couldn't talk. Listen to my voice. I mouthed to him as they're, like, rolling him away, and he's sitting up with this little, like, bleep. Sorry, I'm ruining Stella's birthday face, you know? And I said, I love you. And he went, you know, American Sign Language, which we've been doing on stage to each other forever. And he, like, held it as he, like, went around the corner. And that is the last time I saw him till I saw him. And he went, you know, American Sign Language, which we have been doing on stage to each other forever. And he, like, held it as he, like, went around the corner. And that is the last time I saw him till I saw him. And that is the last time I saw him till I saw him. Dead. The beloved actor of Three's Company fame died September 11th, 2003, after falling ill on the set of his new sitcom. No, 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 no. The 54-year-old was rushed to a nearby hospital where he was mistakenly treated for a heart attack. He actually had a tear in his aorta. Ritter's family got a $9 million settlement from the hospital. But Yazbek sued the cardiologist treating Ritter, claiming he was negligent. She also sued a radiologist who did a body scan on Ritter two years earlier. I think that uh, they knew all along in their heart of hearts that they were going to prevail. The jury took a day to clear both doctors by a 9-3 to three vote. My kids still watch Three's Company, but uh, that had nothing to do with the case as far as uh, the doctors being liable for uh, negligence. I went in there really liking John Ritter a lot, and I think I left really loving him as a husband, as, as a father. He was a great man, um, but again, that's not why we were in court. And Amy Asbeck, good morning. I just want to set the ra record straight. I said earlier that the radiologist had treated your husband the day that he died. That's not correct. No, He'd done a body right. scan several years earlier. A couple years, yeah. I know that um, this trial was very important to you. It has to be disappointing to lose. Um, how have you been dealing with that? How does anyone deal with disappointment? You go on. I mean, the, the family was disappointed, and we, we still believe that these doctors had, you know a hand in it of what of what what happened to John but the jury has spoken you know and the most important thing is we sat there our family was there the jury was there there were a lot of people in the gallery and press is that what it's called the gallery mm -hmm. I don't know I was there for six weeks I didn't learn everything about trials and the most amazing doctors in the world came on both sides I mean the best thoracic surgeons and cardiologists and radiologists and even though it was a debate of, of sorts because it was on both sides it was also this conversation that was so inspiring to our family because it's what we've been talking about for years let's get these guys together so now we can do that outside of a courtroom to talk about aortic research to talk about aortic disease research and aneurysm and dissection and 
You know, what we were talking about mostly in there was the protocol, if there's an emergent situation, mm -hmm. how to get the, the aortic aneurysm and dissection idea high on the list, the differential diagnosis. When you come in, you have chest pain. It doesn't necessarily mean you're having a heart attack. And you, you know, don't play the odds. There's ways that you, that you can hedge your bets on that. But, you know, right before this trial, you were under a lot of criticism by some people. The lawyer for the um, radiologist said, oh, she's being greedy asking for this money. She already made well, money. That's what, you would ex that's what you would expect them to say. But though. they did say that, right. Feelings. And the, uh, that's what I was going to ask you, because the lawyer for the um, the cardiologist after the yeah. trial said to us, you know, my client suffered because of this case, but at least information came out about... Everyone... Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Everyone was, was educated. It was amazing. I mean, it was like... I don't know what you call it in medicine, but in acting or art, it would be a master class. And the most brilliant minds in the in the aorta business were there. And you know that the aorta has always been kind of the the uh, orphan of of medical science because it kind of falls in, in between the cracks, cardiovascular, thoracic. And now there's such focus on it. And there was right after John died, and then it started to wane. And, and actually, I've, this trial has raised awareness again. I, you, you have a foundation, and yes. you receive letters from people in mail. What have I said to you? Um, I've been receiving letters for years, but now this is great because the letters are coming through uh, Mr. Plonsker, Mr. Lebovitz, my, my lawyer is coming through, my, my agent. I mean, I'm getting letters from everybody, and I, I call people and I talk to them people who have had family members that have succumbed to this, which is very hard, but what's important about that is, that we spoke about before, is the genetic testing. There's a very high genetic predisposition for familial aortic dissection. John's brother, Tom. Exactly, who had it as well. It found out only because after John died, you urged him to go get the scan. I, oh, I more than urged. He was like, yeah. <laughs> and, like, and you know, because it's one of those things, well, do you want to know? Well, yeah, because this is completely fixable. And they caught it, and he's fine. He's better than ever. You know, Amy, even the jurors who, who sided with the doctors said, among those who talked, they said, yeah. you know, we, we really liked John before this trial. We fell in love with John, listen, and with his family during this trial. What do you hope that your husband's legacy will be? Well, his legacy is what it always was, which is he kind of plucked that golden thread that, that connects everyone, you know, he was kind of the everyman, the kind of the goofy version of everyman, so everybody related to him, but also I think in his death from aortic dissection, it raises that awareness to a level where people write me. I went into an emergency room and I said, make sure you check me for that John Ritter thing. And by God, they check him for the John Ritter thing. It's not a heart attack, so they don't give him, you know, the wrong medications and the wrong treatment. They treat him for it. They're alive to write me and their kids write me. And our family is thrilled that we could do that. And that's exactly what John would have wanted. Before she played Penny on that show, she was actually John Ritter's daughter on Eight Simple Rules. And you know, in the show, they had a very special yeah, relationship, did. both on and off camera. Well, this Tuesday will mark the 15th anniversary of John's tragic passing, and Kaylee is opening up about her final moments with her TV dad. To this day, if anyone asks me, John Ritter, I, I get this chill because I love him so much. On the day of his death, John fell ill on the set and told the cast and crew he just needed some rest. In the new documentary, John Ritter, Behind Closed Doors, Kaylee says he came by her dressing room and the moment will stay with her forever. I go, hi. I go, are you okay? I heard you're sick. He goes, I'm okay. I just want to talk to you for a second. I was like, okay. And he sat down on the couch. He goes, I love you. And I was like, I love you too, silly man. He goes, no, I want you to know I love you. I said, I love you too. He goes, that's it. And he gave me a hug. And that was the last I saw of him. Like, I love you too, silly man. He goes, no, I want you to know I love you. I said, I love you too. He goes, that's it. And he gave me a hug. And that was the last I saw of him. We always got together in the back and we we got a little circle. And we we always we did John would look at us, all of us and we do a prayer and they look us in the eye. John would say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Every show, and for him not to be back there Friday night, is, tomorrow night, is going to be bizarre. But we're going to send it up to him. It's going to be the first one. We haven't done that yet. 
This is nice. I love him. I still love him. Shoot. You know what it is? This is... It seems like a big mistake. All of... My daughter said... When I was talking to her, I said, this is a kind of a surprise when we were talking about it, but it's a bad surprise. And she said, surprises aren't supposed to be bad. This is a mistake. And I thought, yeah, that's true. So was it love at first sight? Falling in love at first bagel? Mm, nah. I don't know. I don't, I'm, I'm too smart for falling in love at first sight. I don't think so. The smart, funny redhead from Ohio. Amy Yazbek, who came to the big city after losing both her parents, her father to a sudden heart attack, her mother to emphysema. John Ritter was already a big star when they met, and the two of them ignited. Together on the sitcom Wings. I'm glad you're here. Really? No! <laughs> Together on the Bill Cosby Show. We breathe. Everyone said the two of you, it was like watching light. Amy! Amy and John! Hey, just... Wow! John, turn really? Oh, that's so sweet. In a so, good way, Lightning? In a good way. Okay. Lightning. It was as if they were already married by their own alchemy. They didn't bother to make marriage official until Yazbek, eight and a half months pregnant and 60 pounds heavier, was swimming in the pool and... Ritter had a surprise. It was August, and I was just floating there, and he was walking across to me, and he went, uh, like he, and he swore, like he'd cut his foot on something, so I'm thinking there's sharks in the pool because I'm paranoid, and he lifted, and he goes, what is this? And he handed me my wedding ring, uh, my engagement ring, this ring. A very modern marriage with the old songs they loved. When I woke up and heard the news that uh, Paul Ritter had died, I immediately knew there was a massive conspiracy at hand here. Now let me walk you through it. Uh, so, a British actor, Paul Ritter, famous for a sitcom I've never seen, and the Chernobyl thing, playing Comrade Dyatlov, dies at the age of 54, right? Remember, maybe 20 years ago? John Ritter, through his company fame, I think he may have been in Sling Blade, he dies uh, suddenly at the age of 54. Two Ritters, two continents, both dead at 54. There's a massive conspiracy. I seem to be the only one that is aware of it. So, there's something to think about. Birthday presents and rolled around and did puppet shows and played... Lilo and Stitch soundtrack and goofing around the house and I, 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 all day I just, something wasn't sitting right and I thought is it because she's at school on her birthday I just something and then I got a phone call that uh, he called and he said that he thought he had food poisoning and I thought he might you know that sounds right people get it and that he didn't it didn't feel good and then, so he said, M maybe you should come over here. And I said, oh, and I thought, what does he need me to come over there? And then I talked to somebody else from the show, and they said, you know, he's having chest pains. And so we're going to go across the street to the hospital. And it was the longest drive of my life. <laughs> the LA traffic, man. I mean, <laughs> I knew. I don't know what it is. Maybe because I lost my parents. One fast and one slow. I don't know. It just, it smacked of a kind of scary familiarity to me. When I got to the hospital, they thought he was in the midst of having a heart attack by the numbers and that they were going to do a catheter um, to see what was going on in, in the heart. And then, at that time, if something needed to be fixed, fix it. And he was scared of a procedure, but he wasn't, he didn't make me feel afraid or afraid for him. She says he kept worrying about inconveniencing his friends on Eight Simple Rules while she reassured him. Don't think about it. They, people, you know, for smaller things than this, they say, no, somebody's having a bad hair day, they don't do a show. Don't worry about it. And... 
but he was so sweet and we got to say I love you and then he went into the room where they were gonna do this stuff did you have a sense it wasn't going well when you were sitting and waiting yeah did they come out a lot and... before that I knew I knew I don't know why they couldn't figure out what it was he was having trouble during the angiogram which happens sometimes but he was they were losing him and kind of bringing him back during that they found uh, this problem with his aorta this tear and I could just kind of tell by the mood of the people walking by like you know called eight simple rules with John Ritter and we were working on this one particular scene. So I said, what if you run up the stairs, run across the bedroom, hop over the bed, and go to the window upstairs? And as we were doing it, I noticed his breathing became heavier and heavier, and I really didn't want to embarrass him by saying anything, but I didn't want him to do it again. And so I said, you know what? Let's figure out a different way. And he said, okay, thanks. And and uh, I gave him a hug, and we walked down the flight of stairs together, and we ended up knocking off that shot. I was booked to finish that show on that Friday night, and it was about 3 or 4 in the morning, and I was staying at my best friend's house. He said, John Ritter just died. And I... I couldn't believe it. And I asked him, what happened? And he said, well, something happened with his heart. All it made me think was, you know, why didn't I have the guts to open my mouth when I saw him breathing heavily? You know, I had only known him for less than two weeks. And I, I, I had felt like I had made a friend for life. So if I really felt like I had made a friend for life, why didn't I just open my mouth? Why didn't I say something to him?